turning dreams into reality In the lab with the formula and chemistry Your memories spark and motivate And make the industry shake We put the bars in the brakes I'm talking one, one chance at best, yes Painting princes for the culture, keep the brushes fresh Flip the cover, with the drum, a passion of a rest Freedom is our teacher, under pressure, now we bless See, I was so good for the glow It's one art, one shot, now the future is yours, go! Yeah! It's one all oh, one shot, now the future is yours, go! And we are on. Welcome everybody to this episode of Gymnastics Growth TV. Really looking forward to uh, welcoming a special guest with us today, talking about an extremely important topic, which is going to be about uh, mental health and wellness. And particularly, we're going to be talking to, of course, the coaches that are watching, because uh, whilst we are working with young athletes often, or some older athletes as well, trying to influence how they view the world and their mental health and wellness, it is, of course, super important that we do the same for ourselves too as coaches. And the better um, place that we are, with our mental health, the better we are able to help and um, develop and nurture the young athletes that we have spending time with us. Okay, we're going to be talking today with someone with a massive resume within the sport world. We have Leon Taylor, who is a triple Olympic diver and Olympic medalist from Athens, I should say also. Uh, also a TEDx speaker, uh, gone on to, to do many impressive things, lots of work with the BBC, working with um, numerous athletes and coaches within the business world as well, including Tom Daly, who should get a mention in there. And now Leon is also partnered with Headspace as one of their Move Mode coaches, delivering some important things on movement as well. So we're really, really fortunate to welcome Leon Taylor here to Gymnastics Growth TV today. And thank you very much. I know you're super busy. So thank you very much for carving the time out to, uh, to spend some time with us. Apologies, my dogs are going mad in the background. Um, almost an applause for the fact that you're here on Gymnastics Growth TV. Well, that's very kind. Give them a, uh, some fuss when they uh, rejoin you after this uh, broadcast. And thanks for that introduction, Nick. Delighted to, uh, to join you today. No problem at all. It's really great to have you here. Um, I just, there's so many questions that I have um, on, on this topic. And actually, I, I started today, I started the day off by watching your TEDx talk. That, that you did. When was it that you did that talk? Was it a couple of years ago now? Yeah, so June 2018. Okay. And it was, yeah, TEDx in, in Clapham in yep. London. So, yeah, it's quite a, uh, an, an intense experience preparing for uh, a talk that's going to be, you know, on YouTube, uh, on the TED channel forever. And, uh, yeah, so I had to... Uh, had to be quite brave to step up to do that. I've been speaking for many years, but that was, um, yeah, a huge challenge. And um, yeah, it was nerve wracking for sure. Yeah, I would imagine your time as a competitor obviously helped you to prepare for that because it was very much, you know, having to step up on stage, getting one shot, one opportunity to deliver that session. And I have to say, you did remarkable because it was a seamless presentation throughout throughout the whole, um, I, I can't remember how long it was, but it was about, about 15 minutes, I would say it was absolutely seamless from start to finish. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Obviously, the important message behind there was about um, mental health wellness looking after ourselves and i think that um that was a key key message two years ago and is a timeless message which carries a lot of value obviously today as well probably none more so than in today's world why is this such an important topic to you about mental health and wellness yeah so um, i'm very open with my my journey so elite sport as everyone who's tuning in coaches athletes or otherwise will know is brutal um and life is hard Right. And um, when we get injured physically as athletes uh, is, is quite common, uh, we take the time to rest, recover. We go and see someone ideally to help us recover, uh, give us the rehab exercise. I had four reconstructive shoulder surgeries on my shoulder from hitting the water at uh, crazy speeds. And of course, I had the um, yeah, those people around me to advise me on how to recover properly. But when it comes to our mental health, we take a massive hit. I don't know, in sport, let's say it's an underperformance when it really counted. Uh, let's say it's one of your athletes who was, uh, you know, something's happened or, or, or whatever. And we have a trauma, right? So a trauma to the body, boom, my shoulder does that. But a trauma to the mind and we just kind of almost 
carry on and we don't spend any time making sure that we're dealing with these traumas and these impacts. And I learned the hard way. I suffered during my career with a period of depression um, and my mental health really suffered and I didn't know what was going on at the time. And I took on that athlete mindset of just toughing it out and just pushing through and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and we can't do that. We have a duty of care to those around us, those close to us, those who were looking after us as, uh, you know, as coaches or as athletes, as teammates, to look out for each other. And there are many things that we can do to support our mental wellness and our mental fitness and ultimately our mental health. And, uh, you know, they're inextricably linked. You know, if you're physically well, you're supporting your mental wellness and vice versa. And we, we talk about them differently, but they're one and the same. And one of the points that I, I refer to in, in, in my uh, TEDx talk is the fact that we, you know, often think of movement only related to our physical health, but actually movement is related to our mental health. And it doesn't have to be, um, you know, uh, running, doesn't have to be going to the gym, not that the gyms are open or your style of gym, you know, it's, it's, it's like uh, using movement in order to stimulate our nervous system in a way that we support it, the way that we can make it more resistant to the biological response to psychological stress. And I argue in, in that TED talk that unfortunately in the world that we live in now, we spend a lot of time stuck in our heads um, overthinking um, and thinking isn't necessarily the solution to that problem. Thinking is the cause, right? Because you go around in these loops of overthinking. So getting out of our heads and into our bodies, and that can be as simple as you know, a body scan or a breathing technique, or just getting up from your desk after being at the computer for so long, or just taking a walk away from the context that the stressful situation arises in. If a, if a coach and athlete are bucking heads, just you know, taking off and letting the body go for a little bit could just disrupt the buildup of stress because stress is the enemy to our mental health. Um, and movement is, is our best weapon to respond a lot of the time. Yeah, I think to quote to quote um, a section that you said this, this, in the TED talk that I watched this morning was physical movement is your medicine. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, too much time in our heads, not enough time in our bodies. Psychological stress is the enemy to our mental health, and, and you're basically saying the antidote to that is physical movement. So whether that's uh, yeah physical or mental health. Yeah, I think so. Often we get stuck in a place where we're, we think ourselves into a corner and we try and think our way out of it and yeah. thinking just causes more strife. And, and you know, if I was to open up my brain here, which I'm not going to, but there's no psychology in there, there's neurochemicals. And if we can change what's happening neurochemically in the brain, then we change our experience of the world. And one of the fastest ways to change what's happening in our brain is to physically move. Because when you physically move, the body thinks, hang on a second, I need to spring into action. There must be danger. And sets off a process of you know, chemical or neurochemicals being released in order for you to fight flight uh, or you know, get out of the, the danger, but those have massive benefits to our brain health. Neurogenesis takes place. The shape of the brain changes. It's honestly, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I, I take a really uh, deep explore into a lot of the studies out there. And there's an amazing book recently released by, uh, I'm looking at it just out of screen there, Kelly McGonigal, PhD, and it's called The Joy of Movement. Mm. And it's just the book that I would have written if uh, I was a PhD and a brilliant author as, as, as she is. And, and I I'm pleased that my TED talk is two years prior to the book's release because a lot of the stuff that I research and talk about is in there and much more. And the, when you change the shape of your brain, the hippocampus, it increases your cognitive abilities as well. And it promotes great brain health because, of course, you know, neurogenesis is, is called as we you know, start to build uh, new and replace old um, you know, cells in the, in the brain. Uh, and if movement can do all this, then we need to be doing the right movements for us. And so there's a couple of layers to that, which I'm, I'll happily explore. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and obviously you've got a massive depth of knowledge on this, which is fantastic. And I think it's, it's great for the audience to know that, you know, this isn't just theory. You are a, an Olympic medalist that's been through this experience. You were diving before you were nine years old um, or sw swimming, diving before you were nine years old. You've gone through that journey. You've had repeated surgeries. You've, you've experienced the, the trauma and the adversity, both physically and mentally of the sport. And now you're able to positively impact the lives of other coaches and athletes by, by sharing your expertise on this. So it's not that we have um, someone just preaching here, some theory guys. We've got someone who really is at the forefront of, of experiencing this and, uh, and knowing the importance of exercise and physical movement. And Leon, let's be honest, we're talking to a group of coaches. This should be obvious. 
it should be obvious that as coaches we should be moving but i'm going to start by saying i don't move enough i personally don't move enough i am busy being busy i'm you know i'm busy doing my uh, running my i've got two three businesses so i'm busy running those um you know what it's like we just fill our day with all sorts of different things and i i fully appreciate that i need to prioritize movement far more than i than i am now what you're not saying is that we need to commit to being an olympic athlete in order to do this so what do you think are some of the easy steps that any coach that's watching this could take on to start to improve the amount that they are moving and therefore how they're going to be feeling yeah great question and so we're all time poor aren't we to a certain degree whether we have children dogs eight businesses, one business, you know, our, our days get away from each other. And you've already mentioned prioritizing things, you know, well, actually, I can't prioritize this because I've got to do X, Y, and Z. And that comes before. So it's around, it's around routines and uh, routines in gymnastics are massively important routines in sport are massively important. And uh, for everyone, having a routine gives us something to adhere to some guidance and within that routine there are massive things to to pay attention to i think lockdown and the covid pandemic has given us a real chance to look at what we do and go okay how am i using my time it certainly did that for me i was like okay so what are my daily routines now i'm stuck at home when i'm normally here there and everywhere and you know there's there's certain things that are important so there's work obviously whatever that is or study there's rest that needs to be scheduled in there is movement there's also hobbies eating sleeping you know and this is important for the whole household as well especially at, at this time so it comes down to a habits inventory what am I doing that's serving me? And what am I doing that's not serving me? And you have to be brutally honest. You've just done a little one then. You're like, well, I'm busy. I've got my businesses, you know, so there's that, that's serving you. But you're not moving enough. So that isn't serving you. So what are you going to do about it? Well, where are you now? And where do you want to get to? What's the gap? And then how do you start nudging it in that direction? Because if I said to you, right, Nick, come on, we need to get you running every day and you haven't run for ages, that's just going to put you in a hole. It's going to stress the body. You're going to get annoyed and you're going to sack it off and then you'll go back to what you're doing now. But if I said to you, okay, so what movements are you doing already that you enjoy? Oh, well, I really enjoy this 10 minute hit class that I do on, on YouTube or whatever it is, or I joined Leon for one of all classes or whatever. And you go, okay, so what's the next step to factor in a little bit more? And that's how you need to look at these things, looking at your, your yourself and your routines as, uh, as honestly as possible and going, okay, so where, where can I make any tweaks because i could say look you need to exercise for 45 minutes at a low to moderate intensity to get the maximum health benefits blah 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 what can you do specifically within your routines within your commitments to create a little bit more of a healthy habit and then you know pay attention to the things that are tripping you up going to bed late staying on screens uh drinking a little bit another glass of wine or whatever it is and you can tweak those at the same time so if you're turning one up, maybe you need to dial one back. And that's the game. And if you do it gently and uh, with small changes, you don't even notice it's happening. And in six months' time, you're in a completely different state of wellness. And that's what we're after, isn't it? Not big changes that the pendulum swings back, but just tweaks that nudge us in the right direction where we can be even better at what we do. So as coaches, we want to be brilliant coaches. And the only way you'll be a brilliant coach is if you're well. If you're tired, not eating well, not moving, Bumpy, you're going to be a bit of a whatever as a coach, aren't you? And I know that because the coach and I've been coached by by coaches over the years who aren't looking after themselves. And it comes back to the athletes. If you're trying to support your athletes as best as you can, which I know you are, then you need to look after yourself as well. Yeah, some absolute gold in there. And it comes down to practicing what we preach, isn't it? You know, if we're if we're there as a role model and a leader, um, telling athletes to do something, then of course that we should be a reflection of that ourselves. We should be. Um, you know, living with some of those high performing habits as well. And I love what you said there about your habit inventory. Mm. Um, you know, the things that we, we have that we should have in our lives and the things that we have as, as habits that we that we shouldn't do. I guess ultimately it comes down to choice, doesn't it? Because we all have the power of choice. We can choose to do some exercise. We can choose to watch Netflix instead. We can choose to drink a bit more. And um, it does come down to choices. And then I would say discipline with that, mm -hmm. with those choices as well. Yeah, completely. And, and discipline, as we know, in the world that we're in, yeah. you know, is, is an attribute which we all need. But it's not about, um, you know, discipline without, uh, without compassion isn't a very nice place. So, you know, if you do fall over, uh, fall off the wagon, whatever the wagon is, and you, uh, you know, 
whether you're working on nutrition, reducing drinking or moving more and you don't do it one day, it's fine. Just acknowledge the fact that you've missed and then get back on. What often happens with people I'm working with and you know myself in the past, it's like you miss one day and you think, oh, that's it, it's all over, I'm now back on unhealthy eating and then you go like 20 times quicker into the unhealthiness. But it's about just being kind to yourself and, and you know noticing where your weaknesses are and trying to create the circumstances where you remove temptation. So for example, uh, I like biscuits and uh, if they're in the cupboard, then I'm likely to eat them. <laughs> or if they're open, I'll eat them all. So what's the trick? Don't have biscuits in the cupboard. <laughs> I mean, that is available to everyone, but do you see what I mean? So I'm just using biscuits as an example. So, you know, what's in your eye line? So if the, you know, if um, whatever it is, if the wine's out on the side, it'll catch your eye and you'll open it. But if, you know, there's uh, an alternative there, they always say have fruit, you know, in, in vision and then have the things which are less the more of the treats have them you know hidden away so that they, they don't just grab your unconscious attention yeah yeah i think you're you're uh, you're you're bang on there it's about choices <laughs> specific actions and then momentum obviously you can gather once you've started the process so i guess it might be just everyone can find five minutes in a day everybody it doesn't matter how busy you are you can find five minutes so perhaps you just start off with doing five minutes a day for the first week and then you can increase that to sort of eight minutes 12 minutes and then i guess before you know it you're enjoying the process and you're enjoying the benefits of it, and then you're doing a 30-minute session every single day, for example, which is just going to have massive benefits, isn't it, to physical and mental wellness. Exactly, and that's how you make what they call sticky habits. Yeah. Uh, so you just start small, and then, as you just brilliantly described, keep turning up, but, you know, uh, and then if you do it right, you won't even know. It'll just be part of what you do, and, and the person that you're becoming. So you want to be a person that moves more, prove it to yourself with small wins, and away you go. So where do you think the resistance is? Because again, everything we're saying here is relatively simple. We live in a world where we know about the benefits of physical activity and, and, and wellness. We've got everything at our uh, fingertips now. If we need exercises, diet information, etc. So where is the resistance still, do you think? Why are so few people, let alone coaches, actually engaging in these kind of activities themselves? Yeah, it's a good question, isn't it? And everyone will have their their different uh, sticky points that, uh, you know, because we get stuck in our routines and, you know, making change is perceived as being hard, but actually it's effortless once, you, once you've done it. But I think we go about it in the wrong way. Uh, we try and make big changes that are unsustainable. Uh, we, you know, get frustrated with the things that we can't do um, and focus on those too much. So with the habits injury, it's like, well, what can you do? Well, if your sleep is shot because you've got a young child, you can't just go, right, well, I need to sleep more because that isn't possible. But what could you do instead to help with your rest? Well, when the child is napping, you should nap, learn how to nap. And oh, I can't nap. Well, if you're tired enough, you might be able to learn how to do it and just find a way of improving your rest and recovery in that respect. And it's like... If you, if you try and fix a, a problem that isn't there as well, it's like, oh, I need to do this, I need to do that. Well, who says? Like, what do you need to do? And then we make too many changes at the same time is another common mistake. I go, right, I'm going to get fit. So I'm going to start exercising and I'm going to change my diet and I'm going to, you know, and then we don't know what's affecting us. The changes have been too big. And then after a while, we slip and then we think, oh, that hasn't worked. But to make, you know... Uh, success doesn't come from what you do occasionally. It does. It comes from what you do consistently, and that's and that's what we're doing. It's bringing the consistency in there. Um, and if you do that, then you'll see the rewards. But they don't happen instantaneously. And we live in a culture where it's like I want it now, supersized, uh, and I don't want to work hard or wait for it. But then if you look at what we're involved in, sport, that doesn't happen in sport, does it? It's that consistency of turning up, putting in your reps, in skill improvement, skill acquisition. And it's the same for whatever changes we're trying to make for our own wellness. Yeah, yeah. What, what do you think are the consequences then, Leon, about, about not doing this? So I'm specifically thinking about the, the coaches that are watching this. If they're not engaging in movement, for example, and therefore their mental health isn't in a particularly good state, then now they might consciously not know or be aware that their mentally health, mental health isn't good. What do you think the consequence would be to them whilst they're coaching in their kind of day-to-day -day world? Yeah, well, your uh, performance is going to slip in all areas of your life if your foundations of wellness aren't in place. And um, relationships start to suffer, whether they're family or professional, as, mm. what, as we're talking here. And ultimately, the, 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 the big danger is it slides and slides and slides and we get a more of an acute um, issue. 
uh, we're particularly good at um, ignoring symptoms, maybe, uh, you know, as a uh, as a culture, uh, men in particular, we always get a hard time, but the stats are showing that, you know, men's mental health is, is really suffering and uh, we don't say anything, we don't share with anyone, we don't talk, and that's a huge issue. And if we can manage stress in a certain way um, to navigate and to look after ourselves, then it's about mental fitness and mental wellness rather than a mental health issue. But if we leave it too long, it can go uh, to th things more, more, more serious, more consequential, and then it's much more challenging to come out of that. So it, take responsibility early. Uh, and also, what are the messages that we're sending to our children and our young athletes if, um, you know, because they model our behaviours. What we say is one thing, but what we do is what people see and pay attention to. Um, and that's something to, uh, to be very aware of. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Some absolute gold there, Leon. Thank you very much. We're going to come back in just a moment because we've got lots of questions that are flying in. Um, so we're going to address those questions in just a second. But before we do that, I'd like to just show everyone a little bit of a, a short video about the Gymnastics Growth Academy. It's my brand new membership and mentorship program. We're reaching coaches now in 22 countries around the world. Uh, with video content going in there uh, five times a week, stacks of content helping all the coaches from those 22 countries across a spectrum of different topics. Um, of course, we've got the important stuff that we all love to do, the technical work, the methodology, physical preparation. But we've also got the gaps, the areas that most coaches seem to neglect, at least from an educational perspective, such as programming and scheduling and understanding how to deliver their message in the best possible way to get the best possible results. So here's a short video about the Gymnastics Growth Academy. Are you keeping a watchful eye on your athletes' adaptations? This is a program that your athletes will perform every single training day and is used to develop their level of baseline conditioning. We want the shoulders to be open. That's it, very good. The body nice and long, that's good. We're trying to isolate the top of the back, build the pyramid of preparation. The higher the skill level, the more unstable the tower or the athlete will become. I'm giving you the recipe, you just need to choose the ingredients. That might be an element, it might be a routine. From here, find your chest. This is connection drill. We want the athlete to have a really balanced push and pull ratio. And we are live. Welcome to the Gymnastics Growth Academy live broadcast be the best version of you because that's all you can control. Cast to handstand, upper body weight transfer, eight and 15 repetitions. He's sickling in this foot. Make sure that's clean and classy. Nine and rest, good. So our job as coaches is to ensure the athlete fulfills their long-term potential. Anything is learnable and that's what this academy is about. Just commit to being the best version of yourself possible. Until next time, raise your standards. So that is the Gymnastics Growth Academy, which you can find out more information on at gymnasticsgrowth.com. But back to now, we're having a fantastic and important conversation with Leon Taylor. We've got lots of questions coming in. We're talking about mental health and wellness, specifically thinking about our role as coaches and how our own mental health and mental fitness, of course, is super important for the work that we do. Loads of questions flying in. And if you've got any more guys, please do drop these into the comments section. Um, we are going to... Um, ask Leon these. So back to see Mr. Leon. There we go. Awesome. And I'm going to just start off with some of these questions. We've got some fantastic ones coming in. Um, the first one I'm going to read out was from Mark. Let me just find that. There we go. What signals or tells should we look for in other coaches that may be hiding their own depressions or fears? Yeah, it's, well, it's difficult to go through a, uh, a shopping list of look out for this, look out for that. What I will suggest is uh, notice changes, changes in, in behavior, and maybe changes in, in appearance. And when you notice a change, you don't jump into that meaning-making, judging mode that we all have. Ah, uh, Bob looks a little disheveled, that means he must be whatever. Uh, what you can do is uh, ask the person if they're okay. And not just in the, you're all right? Oh yeah, fine, good. But as in, how are you doing? you know, is, is everything all right? And genuinely ask that question. And sometimes you need to ask it a few times in a very 
you know, compassionate and polite way and just really check in with people and maybe say, hey, look, I noticed, you know, that you're looking a little bit tired at the moment. Is, is everything all right? Can I help with anything? How are you doing? And really building those meaningful relationships. We're in you know, sport family and we can look out for each other. And this goes for athletes. This goes for coaches, anyone, support staff, anyone involved is, you know, we have uh, an opportunity to look after ourselves and look out for each other. And sometimes it's easier for those around us to see that things aren't OK. And sometimes you're carrying on regardless under all the stress and all the pressure. And you don't realize that you're moving towards a burnout or moving towards a depressive episode. And it can just be a friendly tap on the shoulder and a check in with someone and check in with them regularly, especially now in lockdown where people, you know, you don't know what's going on for people at home because we're not seeing them. So I think it's that gentle inquiry, not nosy, not you're not accusing anyone of, of you know, anything. It's just checking in and the more we do that and the more comfortable we get with doing that the better we can look out for each other and prevent slippery slides because when they happen they can happen very quickly um i very tragically lost a friend to to suicide uh, two years ago he had no mental health issues before in fact you know he was um you know as far away as you would think from someone being susceptible and therefore, maybe we made the mistake of not asking him if he was OK, because we all assumed that he was fine. So I think even if everyone look, looks fine, just checking in with people anyway, and we can uh, we can support each other. And that's fundamental to everyone's wellness. Thank you, Leon. And thank you, Mark, for that question. That was a, a great one. And we're now going to move on to one of many actually from Rabin. The first one being... You've transitioned into mentoring and uh, he said great work with Tom Daly. Was it a natural decision to do this? Um, what made you go into it? Yeah, lovely question. So um, when I was competing, uh, I kind of without knowing, I sought out mentors. I didn't call them that. But as a young athlete, uh, I competed in gymnastics as well. I went to the NDPs in 1989, ended up just outside the medals. So to, to, to put it into context, so I competed in all these different sports. And right from an early age, I would always ask older athletes uh, what they did, what training are you doing, what do you have for breakfast, blah, blah, blah. And I would always try and learn. And so I benefited a great deal over the years from um, from good mentors. And then I was distracted by uh, mentors who weren't so uh, uh, positively influential, so we say. And uh, and then I get into the end of my career. Um, it was, you know, as a sports person, it's all about you um, and the world revolves around you and you're trying to be the best in the world. And that takes a, a certain mindset and a series of behaviours in order to do that. And then the, the opportunity, the, the kind of the the switch clicked for me and I was like, wow, I've got all this information, all this experience. And if I could share it, you know, that's, that would be really cool. And so the opportunity kind of, you know, a, a twist of fate, if you like, I met Tom and, and, and Tom was my first mentee and I had no idea what a mentor was meant to do, but my intention was to try and share everything I learned in a way that would help someone else. And that's my, my, my process of mentoring now. So it was a lot of trial and error. Um, it's not telling people what to do. I learned that early on. It's about uh, guiding people's attention to what they're doing, asking questions, telling stories, being there as a support, but also as a challenge. Um, and it's a fun, fun, um, very rewarding relationship. And I have mentors now in the areas that I'm working on and, and with. And I think that, uh, you know, I mentor athletes across many different sports. And it's so intrinsically rewarding being part of someone else's journey. And I'm away from the technical stuff. The coaches are there to provide the technical input. I'm talking about life, what's getting in your way, how are you feeling, how are you dealing with mum and dad and other caregivers, what's it like at school, how are your thoughts going, where you may be going to university or what other choices you're going to make. And it's uh, a wonderful um, opportunity for me to continue to, to give back and contribute in that way. And that's one of the things that I'm, uh, I guess my favourite thing that I'm involved in is uh, uh, athletes' journeys. And and. Uh, thank you again, Rabin, for the question and Leo, another great answer. And it makes me think maybe we should be doing more of this in terms of setting up athletes with mentors that are, are not necessarily part of the clubs. They are someone who is external that can provide additional support to the athletes that are not involved with the technical and the tactical side of things like you've just discussed there. So, you know, former athletes with stacks of experience that can share their, their experience with these, these young athletes. So perhaps there's an opportunity there for more clubs to be curating those partnerships and relationships between their athletes as well to, to help support them. Um, so I think that'd be a valuable thing to do. Another question 
Uh, how did it feel to make the decision to retire from competition and how do you feel about it now? Yeah, great question. That's a, it's, a, it's a tough one that all athletes will face at one point or another. So for me, the decision was almost made for me in a funny kind of way because my body could no longer handle what I was asking it to do. I was on my way to my fourth Olympic Games and after f multiple shoulder surgeries, as I've mentioned already, recovered all, all the way f from those. It was my lower back that finally uh, you know, ended my career. I you know, just had a, a worn out disc uh, in between L5 and S1, which meant on a good day, I was in a little bit of pain. On a bad day, I couldn't stand up. And it was so unstable that the, the medical team who were looking after me um, had the red card, if you like, my permission to show me the red card. I did absolutely everything I could. And in, you know, in the build up May 2008, um, I announced my retirement. Um, I announced it live on the BBC because I'd already built the relationship with the BBC sport team uh, and they'd already earmarked me for doing the commentary because of the networking and the, um, the pursuit of that opportunity a few years leading up to those games. So at one point I was uh, potentially going to Beijing as an athlete um, or as a commentator. I was on two lists. So I was, yeah, because you have to get the visas ahead of time. Uh, but my goals were, were all athlete driven, but unfortunately my body couldn't handle it. But when I look back on my career I did absolutely everything I could to try and get to that start line and therefore I have no regrets if I'd have called it too early uh, and then it would have been that moment of oh could I have made it would it have been Olympic gold you know all that kind of stuff I don't have any of that torment because I was in so much pain physically and there's no way possible that I could have got there because my body had broken down so much and that made um, my retirement a little easier as a decision, but the transition into retirement is tough. And uh, that's an important role that I play now uh, for athletes and their well-being is, you know, what happens when your career comes to a close under your terms or often not under your terms. Yeah, which actually was leading into the next question that we've been asked, which is, is related to that. You know, do you think we're doing enough within performance sport to help athletes with that transition of, of going from an athlete to um, well, non-athlete, almost like feeling like they're losing their identity as what they what they once were. Yeah, are we doing enough? I think we can always do more. And as we learn more, you know, we need to do more. And I think it's improving. And um, I think there's still a, a long way that we could go. Uh, but of course, we're limited with resources and there are huge challenges in this space. Whose responsibility is it, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that there, uh, we need to come together as a, as a sport community. And I think mentoring plays a huge role in this to transition from sport into life after sport, whether you still stay close to your sport or not. Some athletes need to step away, some jump right in and become, you know, part of the tapestry. They go straight into coaching or another uh, part of the, the sport uh, family, if you like. And other athletes need to get away from what they've been doing and go and find out who they are. And both are fine. And there's often a blend as well. And I think having uh, someone to turn to who has been there and done it to a certain degree, who has an experience of it, who can support you through that transition where your teammates are going to you have a different relationship with them because they're still doing it and you're not. So that's odd. Um, and then you've got family who are your family and they're great, but they're not particularly good for helping you with transitions. And so you can feel very lost. And I think it's really important that you have uh, someone to support um, and, and turn to and indeed, you know, professional help at that time. So we use, you know, amazing um, sports scientists, psychologists, etc., cetera, to, to help us while we're in our sport. And we need them just as much when we transition out. And I was very fortunate that that service was there for me when I transitioned. Uh, so I was able to try and steady the ship uh, as I went into un uncharted waters. Yeah, excellent. And thanks again for that question. Um, the next one comes in from Nikki. You mentioned before that you had suffered from depression as an athlete. So the question is, when did you realise you were suffering with mental health and who helped you to overcome that? Yeah, so at the time I didn't realise because my strategy was to put on a brave face and just get on with it. And um, yeah, I found myself in a, in a real hole. I uh, didn't recognize it as, as, as it was a depressive uh, episode. And it was a combination of things. So I was working with 
you know, a sports scientist, psychologist in order to get myself back on track. And then I was able to rely on uh, those around me as well. So my teammates were able to, 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 to support me in different ways, in ways that they didn't really realize. I had a great mentor as well, who was the one who finally, you know, helped me get through. And so it's only looking back, and I've spoken to many athletes who look back on their career and go, oh, that's what that was. And it's not putting your hand up, not asking for help and saying, I'm really suffering. I'm so used to being tough, training six, seven hours a day, all this kind of stuff that I didn't re realize that I could put my hand up and say, actually, I'm really suffering here. I'm you know, you know, crying a lot. I don't want to see anyone. I'm, you know, all the symptoms that were that were so obvious then that I was hiding mm. because I didn't want to show weakness or perceived weakness. And now by you know, sharing my story and as many other athletes have been doing, we can make it okay not to be okay, as the saying goes. Yeah. And then you need to take responsibility for asking for help. And there is help available. Um, and that's the most important thing. Absolutely. Thank you for the question, Nikki. Um, coming to your performances, I guess now, a couple of questions here. What was your most uh, memorable performance or competition? I, I'm feeling inclined to think that it's going to be the one where you won your Olympic medal, but I don't want to obviously, um, I don't want to assume that by any means. So what is that your most memorable or is there another particular yeah, performance? Uh, I, th I think it's worth a mention. Uh, the reason it's worth a mention is because, uh, you know, it was 20 years to the day since I watched the Olympic Games on the TV as a six-year-old and was right. captivated by all of the magic. Yeah. Um, and to stand on the podium was a 20-year dream. Uh, and that is a, a moment. The fact that um, four years previously, uh, Peter and I were fourth, just missing out on the medals, and the fact that it was the first medal for 44 years for British diving made it a moment in, in history as well as um, a, a personal journey. So yes, that's definitely worth a mention. But, but personally, there was a, a moment a few years prior to that in 2002 at the Commonwealth Games in Manchester, which uh, you know, diving in front of a home crowd was was unusual. And I remember uh, before my final dive, uh, loads of my friends and loads of my family were there. It was in the evening, so most people had been having a few drinks in the afternoon. So the crowd were raucous. It was unbelievably noisy. I'd never been in a, in a, in a swimming pool where it was so noisy. It was so noisy that the announcer announced my name and I couldn't even hear my name. It was unbelievable. And the intensity of that moment before that final dive was something I will never, ever, ever forget. And I just look, I've watched back on the TV and I'm there and the noise is so much and I'm normally, you know, focused and pretty stony faced. And I just go like that. And I've just got this beaming smile because of the just joyous occasion. And that was at the end where I was just making it through the toughest point of my career where I was coming out of my depressive episode. And that's when I came back you know, just missing out on the gold medal in that Commonwealth Games to, to Peter, uh, Peter Waterfield, who won the gold there in, a, in an amazing showdown of some of the world's best divers who were actually in the, in the Commonwealth. So the Commonwealth w weren't easy uh, in that competition. We, the Australians and the Canadians were so strong. And that, for me, when I reflect back uh, a moment, it's not because of the result, but just because of the point in my career. And that unique experience of intensity was really something. Amazing. Yeah, I'm, I can almost, uh, I'm getting goosebumps just sort of <laughs> <laughs> picturing the, the, the atmosphere and how electric that would have been for you. Um, what about the, the Olympic experience itself? Can you just talk mm. a little bit, aside from, of course, the, the, the medal, um, which is unbelievable, but tell us a little bit more about the Olympic experience and what that meant to you as an athlete and how special mm. that was? Yeah, so and I, I was fortunate to compete at three Olympic Games. The first Olympic Games when I was 18, I did my A-levels in the same year. I wasn't expected to qualify. It was against the odds. I lived in Cheltenham Spa in Gloucestershire. Mm -hmm. We only had a five-metre diving board, uh, but I qualified on the 10 metres. So I was travelling every weekend with my coach, two and a half hours down the road to Plymouth or up to Sheffield to train. And it was just extraordinary. I was in the Olympic Village, surrounded by my heroes, the youngest member of the team, uh, dream come true, um, unbelievable. And then four years later, Sydney, what an incredible place to go, uh, much more focused on the outcomes, potentially taking it too seriously. So I didn't really enjoy that experience. Right. And then the results were frustrating. And then I got it right in Athens. I went there with a big smile on my face and recently did an article with, with British Swimming as they were looking back at, uh, at my career. And the, and the change that I made is that, you know, this was the special occasion and, and the Olympic Games is to be enjoyed. That doesn't mean you're there to not um, do your very best. But just, you know, preventing yourself from enjoying the world's greatest event taking place that you're part of mm. is so, so important. You're a long time retired. 
And you don't realize that till you're retired from sport. And I think absorbing every second, because a dive takes 1.5 seconds. And if I hang my 20 year career on just one of those dives that won me an Olympic medal, it's it, that's not very good rate of, uh, rate, uh, rate of return, is it, for your investment of time? Yeah, but if yeah. you can look back on periods and go, wow, that was so enriching, so enlivening, and the games themselves are just magical. And to be part of them in any capacity is, mm. is, is, is wonderful. That's got to be a really tough balance because you're absolutely right. You spend your life, your 20 years, uh, obviously leading up to the medal, but, but years and years and years getting to the Olympics in the first place. You want to take it seriously because you want to perform at your best, particularly if you're a medal contention. But yeah, you don't want to take it so seriously that you fail to enjoy the experience because it might be your only time that you get the opportunity to do it. In your case, you were at three Olympics, which is great. Um, some athletes will have, I guess, just, just one shot, one chance. That must be a really tough balance for those that are seriously in medal contention. Yeah, and that's, that comes down to, you know, your mental preparation and yeah. being able to deal with that cognitive, dis cognitive dissonance. So it's just like the Olympic Games are the most important event ever. I'm going to train my backside off every single day in order to get there. Uh, they are the most important event. There's nothing more important. All my decisions are around that. If you hold that belief strongly, which you need to every day, that will get you there. But if you think about that on the day, <laughs> good yes. luck holding your state and performing well. You need to then be able to hold an opposing belief that says, it's just another competition and uh, it doesn't really matter because my family will still love me and, you know, it's been fun or whatever, you know, yeah. and then you need to be able to hold them both in your psychology at the same time. Good luck with that. It's tough, but it's possible. <laughs> and it takes practice and persistence and determination and discipline yeah. and consistency. And, uh, and, and yeah, and that's the beauty of it, right? So perhaps this can weave us a little bit into the work that you're doing with Headspace at the minute. Um, now, you're, you're actually doing the work from, on the movement part, aren't you? But Headspace is obviously com really, really well known for the mindfulness um, mm. aspect of it. And that's something that you also believe in as well. Am I, am I right in saying that you, you know, practicing mindfulness and the, and the benefits of yoga, for example, mm -hmm. etc. Do you think that those activities would also be beneficial for, for coaches and athletes to help them manage their levels of stress and anxiety, particularly when it is you know, coming up to big competitions? Yeah, hundred percent, and uh, it makes it's the same kind of um, suggestion that we uh, we talked about earlier. It's like, well, how do you start? Where do you start? Well, start small. Uh, the app Headspace is perfect, and it's free. Uh, you know, obviously, you can buy a subscription. There's plenty of content in there, and it gives you the opportunity to start to uh, flex your mindfulness muscles, whatever that is. Whether it's uh, breathing meditation, whether it's uh, closed eye. Well, you know, there's so many different ways of going about. Um, looking after ourselves, relaxing, scanning our bodies, really starting to look after ourselves. And if we can bring that into a practice, we're overstimulated a lot of the time. We've got a device in our hand all the time, or we're thinking about things all the time. It's rare that we get a chance to like power down, um, you know, just going for a walk in nature and other things are massively beneficial to our autonomic nervous system. We spend a lot of our time in, you know, high alert. Uh, we need to learn how to shift ourselves into parasympathetic towards rest and digest and meditation, mindfulness practices are hugely important. I did an Instagram live with Tom Daly recently and I was chatting to him about well, how you're getting on lockdown, what are you doing, let's share you know, his top tips with, with everyone out there, athletes included, and he's teaching himself by YouTube how to knit. And I would say, well, tell me more about that. So he's obviously recently a father. So he's knitting something for his son, Robbie. But also he was sharing with me and the audience that how it's really improving his mindfulness. So we talk about what is mindfulness is being present. So how do you do that? Well, you take part in an activity, so breathing or knitting in Tom's case, that really brings you into the moment. So what's the benefits of that? Well, he's building that skill now. So as we go to Tokyo 2020 next year in 2021, his mindfulness skills are going to be even more robust. And is that going to help his performance? Is that going to help him manage his state when the circus comes to town? Of course it will. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a great example, again, of, a, of an athlete who is at, still at the top of their game and yet still looking at ways of improving um, their, their mental tools even, even more so, you know, despite already being an Olympic medalist themselves. Um, I think there's a lot of value in coaches, of course, doing that. I mean, I can think back to, I haven't been on the competition floor for a while now. It's not really in the nature of the work that I'm doing at the moment. But if I think back to some of the bigger competitions that I was privileged enough to be on the, uh, in the arena floor, if you like, I mean, the night before, you know, lack of sleep and how that kind of, I mean, you, 
a coach is a performer as well as an athlete. Like the coach needs to be able to, to perform at their peak on the same day as the athlete. And if the coach isn't able to sleep through stress, anxiety, worry, and fear, then obviously that's gonna be detrimental to the athlete as well. And so some of these tools that you're talking about, mindfulness, et cetera, um, are really valuable, I think, for, for coaches that are on this journey as well, to better serve themselves, but also to better serve the athlete and to do the, to, to do the great job. Because you're right, we are, um, our, our inability to hold attention now is phenomenal, isn't it? Mm. I mean, even you know, scrolling through social media and just getting distracted by all the things there, or um, whether that's the telly or advertising, you know, we're constantly having people trying to gain our attention. So that ability to switch off and just focus on the breath, for example, is just immensely powerful, really, really important skill to have, I think. Um, which in its very nature should sound, again, very simple, but because we're not training it, it's actually quite complex to begin with. Yeah, agreed. And it's, uh, it's a case, you know, when you need it the most, uh, you'll have need to have put in the hours, right? So if you want to be able to sleep the night before a big competition, uh, you don't try your breathing technique the first time then, or you don't start meditating that night, right? It's done, you know, way before you get to that uh, occasion. Yeah. Um, like any skills, you don't just, you know, try that, you know, dismount for the first time in competition, you train it. And so when you train skills, uh, and these are, you know, mental fitness skills, mindfulness skills, they will be there when you need them, but only if you've put the hours in. So it comes down to consistency again. Um, and giving it a whirl, finding a way to bring it into your routine, make it fun do it with other people be creative um but do it and i guess headspace is a great a great way for people to step into that world because it is fun it's novel it's um you know and there's just great content on there millions of people around the world are, are participating in that uh, including yourself and you're not only participating as a um as a user of headspace but of course you're contributing to the platform as one of their, their coaches as well which is awesome so i'd really encourage everybody to to check out the headspace app if you haven't done so already um just a couple more questions if you if you don't mind um leon this is a fascinating conversation i think that the audience are getting a lot from this um uh, da, 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 da. let me just find the most relevant one here which came up a few minutes ago. Uh, it was regarding you uh, being a national champion at the age of 11. Was there a lot of pressure to deal with that at a young age and how did you manage it? Because this is oft often something that happens within gymnastics, that we can have national champions at the age of nine and 10 years old. Um, and I'm not always sure that's a positive thing. Yeah, so... Um... For me, it was hard because I did three sports when I was at that age. And my mm. gymnastics coach spoke to my mum and dad and said, right, Leon needs to train every day. And so did my diving coach. So at the age of 11, mm. I had to make a decision between two sports that I loved. Um, and luckily for me, swimming, I was doing that every morning at 5 a.m. So I was able to continue with that. But at 11, I chose diving over gymnastics because... Uh, well, because I won the national championships at under 12s in, in diving. And uh, also that was the one that I enjoyed the most if I was forced to make a career decision, which I pretty much was at 11. So that was the hard thing for me then. It wasn't necessarily the pressure of competing because I was filled with joy when I was competing, when I was doing uh, my training for my sports. Uh, but it is something to be aware of, isn't it? And it's um, tiger parents, tiger coaches, right? Whose goals and dreams are we talking about here? Are we forcing our dreams and ambitions upon the person that we're looking after? And I think that's where we need to be really careful. If it's driven by a tiger athlete, I want to go to training. I want to do this. This is what it's about for me. Great. If anyone's leaning on them, not so great. And they, we need to be very aware of that. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it is. I mean, sport is, is pressure and there's expectation. And it's about finding ways to navigate that. And there's fantastic support networks out there. And again, we've mentioned a few times mentoring. It's like, well, if you're 11 and national champion, who else in your club or area or something has experienced that? Could, would you be able to like chat to them and find out how they dealt with it and learn from them and find a support there to make sure that you're not alone and having to deal with expectations pressure etc yeah yeah and we've linked to that how young do you think we can start these mental skills training um with athletes so you know can you start some of these things with nine and ten year olds is that is that too early is it too late can we start even earlier do you think yeah let's start early let's start as early as possible as soon as you start engaging in the physical activities of your sport you're already you know building uh the mental uh, approaches that go along with that. Yeah. Uh, so let's start building them properly. 
let's start, you know, uh, winding down the body at the end of uh, a gymnastics training session by stretching. And at the same time, winding down the mind. So letting things go and start to learn how to settle down because that's going to be a great skill. If you can do that seven, eight, nine, ten, then you're going to be um, uh, well set as you go on into, um, into your future career. And so, yeah, the earlier, the better, but manageable and make it engaging and sell it to not, not sell it. That's unfair. Um, inspire the athletes to engage by, you know, saying, well, if you want to be able to do this uh, physical move, then you need to be able to do these mental things. And this is the, the things that all top athletes that you look up to are doing over to you. And you'll notice the engagement. Unbelievable. Thank you, Leon. Leon, this has been a fascinating conversation. I've learned a lot. Uh, I'm feeling inspired to get moving today. I need to do more. Um, <laughs> you've raised my awareness to that again. So thank you very much. And thanks for coming on Gymnastics Growth TV and sharing your expertise. I'd also like to take this opportunity to congratulate you on everything that you have done so far and continue to do. Um, you know, your, your resume is impressive. It's very impressive. It's very inspiring. So not just the Olympic medal, of course, but all the work that you're doing in the community, uh, the, the, the work around fundraising, you know, the, uh, obviously the TV work, the Headspace stuff, the TEDx talk. I mean, you've got a lot going on and uh, I'm very inspired by it. So thank you very much for your contribution to sport, your continued contribution and uh, just, just wishing you luck with everything moving forward. But thank you so much for taking the time to share your knowledge and wisdom with the audience. Much appreciated. Thank you, Nick. Thanks for having me. Absolute pleasure. And uh, I hope you'll all agree, guys, that was a really fascinating discussion there with Leon. And uh, again, thank you very much for your participation, for your great questions that you've posted here in the comments section. I'm sorry if I haven't got through everybody's questions, but we do have a finite amount of time uh, for this call today. So thank you very much for being here. Thanks for the engagement. Before we go, I'm going to show you one more video about one of the other services that we've got available at Nick Ruddock Gymnastics. Many of you will also will already be aware of the masterclass recordings, which are currently discounted at 50% off. There's over 22 hours of technical content available that you can find at nickroddock.com. But uh, instead of using your imagination, here's a short video to help you understand exactly what, what it's about. It's the first of six masterclasses. Today is all about vault and sprint development. I'm just very excited about the fact that we're all here together. People have a love for bars. I'm going to certainly demonstrate some of the passive and more active ways in which I would prepare something that's in contact with the floor constantly. Keep that hand low. Don't let me see your ears. Bent knees, closed shoulders, okay? Conversations about how you can take some of these ideas, implement it at home and improve the level of your athletes. How can we take young athletes and develop them on a high performance pathway? Jodie's been one of the top coaches in the UK, produced multiple athletes on the GB team. We want open chest, we want long spine so we can create some extra tension on the top half of the hamstring. So the amount of swing that she has coming from the top bar is greater than what she has on the low bar. You're carrying the speed from the round off flick into a takeoff. All you're gonna do is send that rotation flying. You can have no chance at all. A bit higher, good. It's all in the same family of movement. There's no need to, to jam that hip shut. Do you see how knocking out that vestibular system and the eye focus changes how people balance. Stops it from getting boring. There's nothing worse than the, the, having a predictable program. But couple that with great energy in the gym, great motivation, high standards, all of that together, that's gonna have an impact on your athletes. And that was the masterclass of recordings available at nickroddock.com. Make sure you check those out. They're currently discounted at 50% off. Again, thank you very much for yourselves, guys, for being here. Much appreciated. I hope you can join us again in future episodes of Gymnastics Growth TV. If you want to catch up with the 10 or maybe 11 now previous episodes, you can either scroll down this Facebook page or find them on my YouTube channel, nickroddock.com. They're all uploaded there for you to watch. And some of them have also been uploaded as podcasts. Um, you just got to search for the Gymnastics Growth Show podcast. That's either on Spotify or on Apple Podcasts. But thank you so much for being here, guys. Have a fantastic week. I look forward to catching up with you on the next episode of Gymnastics Growth TV. See you now.